but Prabhupada explained to them, he said, yes, I'm also a member of this con. That he considered himself to be a member, and at the same time, of course, he is the founder of the ISKCON society. So sometimes we do get problems, we get difficulties. People want to, they want to go out of ISKCON and they want to make their own society. So Srila Prabhupada understood that that may happen and he, he didn't mind so much. He understood that for some people it would be difficult to work together with everyone. And he, even in his own time, when he was present, he allowed some people to go out and to make their own society. But Prabhupada encouraged them. He said, keep the same standards. Keep the same standards. Just like we have the four rule, the four principles, and the daily chanting of 16 rounds. And he encouraged them to also do things like shave their heads, and have a shika, and wear the neck beads, and tilak. These things, these were the, these are like the signs of the Vaishnava, of the devotee. So Prabhupada didn't mind so much that people went out of this con, but he wanted that they would keep the standards which are there in this con. Prabhupada worked very hard to impress upon us the importance of spiritual standards. Spiritual standards, things like waking up early in the morning. Prabhupada himself would hardly sleep. He would, he would get up about midnight and he would begin to translate his books. Uh, he would take some rest, sometimes in, in the afternoon, sometimes in the evening, he would rest for a couple of hours, maybe like from 10 o'clock to midnight. And then he would wake up without even an alarm clock. He himself would get up and he would do his translation and write his commentaries. It was a very good time for Prabhupada to write. During the daytime, of course, just like here, it, it's hot. And then many, many, many visitors, certainly wherever Prabhupada went, there were many visitors. People would hear that, oh, this great Swamiji has come. The one who has spread the Hare Krishna mantra to the Western world. And many people would want to see him. They would all come. Many different people, reporters, sometimes television cameras, different people from all walks of life. Somehow they were attracted to come and from the Swamiji. And Prabhupada liked to meet people. He liked to talk to them and to discuss philosophy with them. He considered that was his duty as a spiritual teacher. He would teach all of us how to present the Krishna conscious philosophy. How to tell people about Krishna. Just like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Kurmakshetra and there was a Brahmana there who wanted to leave his home and go with Lord Chaitanya. And the Brahmana was saying to Lord Chaitanya, 
I cannot tolerate the pains of the material world. I want to leave everything. I want to leave my family and just go with you. But Lord Chaitanya did not encourage this mood. And Lord Chaitanya was very emphatic, very powerful about enforcing his mood onto this Brahmana. And he told the Brahmana, don't, don't speak like this again. And Lord Chaitanya gave his famous instruction to the Brahmana, telling him, Yari Deki Kari Kaho Krishna Upadesh Amar Agaya Guru Hana Tara Etesh. That wherever you go, whoever you meet, tell them about Krishna. And in this way, become a spiritual teacher. Is it a Lord Chaitanya? Amar Agaya Guru Hana. By my order become a spiritual teacher and deliver the world. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ordered this Brahmana in Kurmakshetra how he should use his time and how he should dedicate his life to telling people about Krishna. And it was the order of Chaitanya He's ordered, not only is he giving the order to this Brahmana at Kurmakshetra, but he's giving the order to all of us that we should all tell people about Krishna. We should all become like spiritual teachers. You may say, oh, I know I don't want to be a teacher. But Actually, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, yes, you should. But you should know about Krishna. You have to hear regularly the topics of Krishna. Lord Chaitanya met with Ramananda Rai. They met on the banks of the Godavari. Godavari, one of the holy rivers in South India. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, after he'd been at Kurmakshetra, he came further south and he came to a place which is on the opposite side from a town called Rajamundri. Rajamundri, we have an Iskon temple there today. So, on the opposite side from that town, Ramananda Rai had come there with an entourage because Ramananda Rai was a governor in the district of South India. He was in charge. On the, the whole area was actually ruled by the king of Puri. The king of Puri, in the times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was Maharaj Prataparutra. And it said the king of Puri is a descendant of Indra Jumna Maharaj. Not the Indra Jumna we have in Iskon, but the Indra Jumna who established the worship of Lord Jagannath thousands of years ago. So Maharaj Indrajumna's descendant in the times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was Maharaj Prataparudra. And he had a big kingdom. The king of Puri was very powerful. He was fighting with the Nawab. In Bengal, there was a Nawab, Hussein Shah. It said he was Jarasandha incarnation of Jarasandha. And the Chankazi was there in Mayapur. He was Kamsa. They came in Krishna and Chaitanya Viva. So they were fighting and they were trying to fight but they could not defeat the king of Puri. The king
king of Puri was very powerful and he had such an empire it went all the way down into South India to Rajamandri, almost all the way to Chennai. It was a huge empire, a huge kingdom. And Ramananda Rai, he was in charge of the region and the southern part of the kingdom. So Lord Chaitanya had met with Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was the priest in the Jagannath Puri temple. He was the head priest and he was very close to the king of Puri. So Lord Chaitanya had made Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya into a devotee. Before he met Lord Chaitanya, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was a logician and a mental speculator and a jnani. So he had all impersonal conceptions about the nature of the Absolute Truth. It is said Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya was the incarnation of Brihaspati. Brihaspati was the guru of the demigods. So he came in Chaitanya Lila as Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. And Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya had been made into a devotee by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That's the whole long story, but we won't tell that tonight. But Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, he told Lord Chaitanya that when you go to South India, you must meet this man, Ramananda Rai. That Ramananda Rai, he is a great devotee. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was taking his bath at the Kotavari. You know, in those days, there was no pipes and there was no uh, water running from taps. You took a bath, everybody would go to the river and take a bath. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he was traveling, he took his bath at the Godavari. And while he was there at the Godavari, at that time Ramananda Rai came. He was the governor. Even the governor has to come take bath in the river. So he came with a big entourage with all of his servants, and secretaries, and people who were assisting him. The Ramananda Rai came there and he met with Chaitanya. Somehow the two met together. And when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met with Ramananda Rai, then they awakened their ecstatic love. Because Ramananda Rai, he is an incarnation of the Gopi Vishaka. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we say, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Radha Krishna Nahiyanya. Mahaprabhu is not different, he is the combined form of Radha and Krishna. He is Krishna, but he has come in the mode Srimati Rajaman. He wants to experience that Radha Bhav, that great love which Radha has for Krishna. So, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met with Ramananda Rai. And Mahaprabhu understands the spiritual identity of Ramananda Rai. That Vishaka Gopi is the very dear friend of Srimati Radharani. And so Mahaprabhu is very happy to meet with Ramananda Rai. And they discussed together. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was born in a Brahmana family and he, later on he took sannyas. He took sannyas 
in the line of Shankar Acharya. In order to take sannyas in the line of Shankar Acharya, you must be in a Brahmana family. Nobody can take sannyas in that without being born in a Brahmana family. You may see some, there were some people, like maybe you remember that one man, Maharishi. Remember him? Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. He was quite a prominent. He actually wanted to take sannyas, but because he was born in the the Brahmana family, they wouldn't give him sannyas. So he just had to go on his own, become a Maharishi. <laughs> it is impertinent, but he was following the Advaita mark in personalism, monism. So Ramananda Rai, he was born in the Sudra family. He was not born in the Brahmana family, but he was highly educated. He had studied all of the scriptures and he had a lot of knowledge about Lord Krishna and the different relations and emotions, the loving ecstasies which are experienced between Krishna and his devotees. So, when Lord Chaitanya met with Ramananda Rai, he, Lord Chaitanya began to ask questions from Ramananda Rai. And Ramananda Rai protested. He said, no. He said, listen, he said, you are the sannyasi. You are the Brahman. I should be putting questions to you. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Kipa vipra kipa nyasi sudra keni nai. Ye Krishna tatpavit se guru hoi. He said, kipa vipra. He said, it doesn't matter if you are a vipra. Vipra means like a learned Brahman. Or a nyasi, a renunciate, sannyasi. Kipa vipra kipa nyasi sudra keni nai. Even your sudra. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what position you're born in, in the material body. Ye Krishna Tattvaga, say Guru Hai. If you know the Krishna Tattva, if you know the science of Krishna, then you can become the spiritual teacher. So this is Lord Chaitanya's instruction his judgment in this matter, that one may be born a Brahmana, he may not be a devotee. So he may be born in the Brahmana family, but he has no devotion, even though he studied the scriptures, but if he has no devotion, then he should not become spiritual teacher. And someone else, they're not born in a good family, they have a low birth, by material step. But if they have studied the scriptures and they have devotion, then they can also be spiritual teachers. So we have to understand the qualification is not material, but it's an opportunity for everyone. Just like Srila Prabhupada himself, he was not born in the Brahmana family. His Bengali name was, the family name was Dei. So they were business people. He was from a wealthy business community. But they were not Brahmins. And we should understand that there, some people give too much importance to birth. It's not the birth so much. But what is important is the devotion. And we can see in the life of Lord Krishna. Now Lord Krishna was born in the family of the Yadus. 
the Yadus, meaning there was people like Udav and others there in the Yadu family. But Lord Krishna had more interest to be with the Pandavas. The Pandavas were not in the Yadu, from the Yadus. They were different. They're from the Kurus. But Lord Krishna, although he was born with the Yadus, he was born from Vasudev and Devaki. They were from the Yadu family. But Lord Krishna was more attracted to the Pandavas because they were the more devotee people. Yadus, the Yadavas, they were also devotees of Krishna. But Krishna took more interest, he had more affection for the Pandavas. Just like we were reading this morning about how much, how Krishna cared so much for Arjuna to help him overcome so many difficulties. Lord Krishna would always be there to help him overcome any obstacles. Even when his life was being threatened by Grandfather Bhishma, Lord Krishna broke his promise and picked up the chariot wheel and came kind of rushing towards Grandfather Bhishma. He broke his promise to save the life of his dear devotee, Arjuna. So Krishna shows how he has the deepest love for his devotees, like the Pandavas. He doesn't just care only his, who is his mother, who is his father. His mother, Vasudeva Devanaki, they were in prison. Lord Krishna was in Vrindavan with the cowherd boys. Lord Krishna was enjoying in Vrindavan with all the people in Vrindavan. He was enjoying his Leela there in Braja. His mother and father were in the prison. Didn't he care about his mother and father? No, he cares. But he cares more about his devotees. So we ourselves, we often get lost in bodily affection. We're thinking about the family relationships, these things. These are what we call fallible soldiers. They cannot save us at the time of death. You know, when actually it's in, we are encouraged that in old age, you don't want to stay at home. You want to get out from the home. And we see in the Srimad Bhagavatam how Vidura came back to preach to Dhritarashtra. That Dhritarashtra had been staying at home with the Pandavas. Although Dhritarashtra had tried for so many years to have the Pandavas killed, and he had encouraged his sons to go to war with the Pandavas. Dhritarashtra wanted so much to see his sons victorious in the battle of Kurukshetra and to finish the Pandavas. But it was not to happen. Instead, Dhritarashtra's sons were all killed. And Dhritarashtra was left. And he was staying in the home of the Pandavas, eating the food of the Pandavas. So Vidura was the brother of Dhritarashtra, right? There were three brothers, Pandu, Dhritarashtra, Vidur. Vidur was born from the maid servant woman. Vidur is actually Yamaraj. Yamaraj had a curse against him. He had a curse. 
the story is that young, uh, that there was one Muni, uh, some Mandaka Muni, Mandaka Muni, who was in the cave. And it happened that some gang of thieves also came into that cave. So Manduka Muni, he, did, he, he just stayed in this cave because it, he'd been living in that cave a long time. But these thieves, they had been killing people and robbing people. And then they came to hide from the, the police and the army were coming to look for them. And they went to hide in the cave. And it happened, the king's soldiers came and they arrested everybody in the cave. And they arrested this Manduka Muni also. They thought he is one of the gang of the thieves. And they all went to court and the judge sentenced all of them to death. They all have to die. And in those days, they killed people in a very horrible way. They had they would make them walk off a plank onto many spears. There were many sharp spears all going up in the air. And they would have to walk off the plank and fall onto the spears. And their whole body would be pierced by these spears. In this way they would die a very painful death. So they were to die like that. And it happened that Manduka Muni, although he was innocent and he was a great sage, he was also put into that situation. And what could he do? He just accepted it. Somehow, just before they were able to kill Manduka Muni, the king heard about what had happened. And the king immediately came and he came and he fell at the feet of Manduka Muni and he begged the sage, please forgive me, a great mistake has been made. I know you are not guilty of anything. Please forgive us for any injustice and please go back to your life of renunciation. So Manduka Muni was freed and he thought to himself, what happened? What did I do to deserve this? You know, when things go wrong in our life, we should also reflect. What happened? Why is it like this? What did I do wrong to deserve this? There must be some reason, you know. Of course, when we have surrendered to Krishna, if we have taken shelter of Lord Krishna, then we understand it's the plan of Krishna. For the devotee, it's not karma. Devotees don't suffer karma. But devotees, they may get some special arrangement of Krishna, which appears like suffering. So Manduka Muni, he wondered what had happened. Understand, this Manduka Muni was not a pure devotee. He was a sage, he was a yogi, but he was not a pure devotee. So he still had some karma. So he went to see Yamaraj to find out what happened. Why did this thing happen to me? And so Yamaraj told him, he said, when you were a young boy, you used to take pieces of grass, sharp grass, and you would pierce insects, and you would stick the grass into the bodies of insects, and you would collect insects on the piece of grass. So the punish, this was your reaction. You do harm to someone, it will come back to you, right? As we, we, the, in the Christian Bible, they also teach about this. They say, as you sow, so shall you reap. 
In China, they say the same thing. Shan yo shan bao, e yo e bao. Right? And in Hindi, they have the same thing. They say, jaisa karega, aisa barega. Right? It's the same thing. It's the law of nature. You do harm, you give pain to someone, who will come back on you. Right? So, we have to be very careful about what we do and what we say to people because we should know that there will be reactions for these things. So, Manduka Muni, he asked Yamaran, what did I, 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 he said, I was piercing insects. I was a young boy and I was piercing insects like that. So, Manduka Muni thought, this is not fair. I was just a young boy. I was a child. I didn't know what was good and what was corrected me. So Mandukamani, he cursed Yamaraj. He said, your, too, your punishment is not fair. So he said, I curse you to take birth in, a, in the womb of a sutra lady, in the womb of a working class woman. So it happened that Yamaraj was born in the womb of a maidservant woman in the palace of Hastinapur. And he was conceived in that womb by the semen of the Asadi. So Vidura was a saintly person. Actually, this cursing of Yamaraj was also a blessing. You know, sometimes we don't appreciate the blessings of Krishna. But it was a blessing because he was serving as Yamaraj every day. He has to punish all the sinful people. Oh, this man. Oh, okay, put him in Kumbi Pakaloka. Right? Put him in the boiling oil. And take this one, put him and let him embrace the red hot forms. And this one, let him be fed to the birds. And have this one, let his body be so, so attached, so his body, stitch, stitch everything through his body. He would have to sentence people to different kinds of hell. So not a very pleasant job, you know, if you have to do that kind of work. Sentence people to all different suffering. So, you don't meet very nice people, you know, you don't get good association. And Yamaraj is a devotee. He's actually a devotee, but he didn't get much association. So it was arranged that he got a break from his job. That by the curse of Manduka Muni, he gave up, he was, you know, Taken, had, had to give up his position for some time and he went off and became Vidura. And so Vidura was a saintly person and he was ins instructing Dhritarashtra. He came back. Actually, Dhrita Vidura, when he was living in the palace with his brother Dhritarashtra, there was some quarrel because Vidura would always tell Dhritarashtra, don't listen to your son. That Duryodhan, that son of yours is no good, is very bad. Don't be influenced by him. So Duryodhan heard how Vidura was trying to influence his father. So Duryodhan threw Vidura out. He said, you get out from this palace before I beat you. So, <laughs> so Vidura saw, he saw the mercy of Krishna in two ways. One way was Krishna was taking things away from him, taking away his comfortable position in the palace, but at the same time he saw Krishna's mercy 
that Krishna is arranging for me to detach myself from the material world and I can go to the holy places and I can go and associate with all the saintly persons and hear from them. And Vinura did that. He went to Uddhava and he heard from Uddhava and then he went to Maitreya and he heard from Maitreya. And these were all very great personalities. And they had been with Krishna at the time Lord Krishna was leaving the world. Lord Krishna had given instructions to Uddhava and Maitreya was also there to hear. So Vidura was able to hear from them who had had direct association at the very final moments of Lord Krishna leaving this world. So Vidura came back to see his brother Dhritarashtra and he's, he wants to get his brother free from all of his attachment to the material world. And he, he tells Dhritarashtra that from, from birth you were blind material, but you are also blind spiritually. You have no spiritual vision. And he said, now in your old age, you cannot hear well, you cannot properly digest food, you have to eat very simple food, and you are eating the remnants of your enemies, like Bhishma. Vidura mentioned the name of Bhishma because it was Bhishma who killed all the 100 sons of Dhritarashtra. So Dhritarashtra had a special hatred for Bhishma because he killed all of his sons. But still Dhritarashtra was so much in ignorance that he was eating the remnants of Bhishma every day. So, Vidura, in this way, by speaking these very uh, important points to Dhritarashtra, he could impress on Dhritarashtra the situation which he was in and he could convince him to get out from the home. Getting out from the home is difficult because we're attached. We see Prabhupada also that he said, Krishna arranged for me to get detached. Krishna took everything away from me. took away the business, and when there was no business, there was no money, and when there was no money, then the family no longer respected him anymore. So Prabhupada saw time to leave the home. Just like there was one sannyasi named Mahavishnu Goswami, Remember him? Gujarati man? Mahavishnu Goswami? We've never met him. And he, he was an elder. He left the world now, but he used to go to Singapore. And uh, he was very active in India, preaching in India. And he went to Australia also. Anyway, Mahavishnu Goswami, he said something very interesting. He said, it's better to leave the home in such a way that when you leave, the family will say, oh, where did he go? But if you don't leave the home, if there was, they will say, when are you going? <laughs> if they have to say, when are you going? It's not very nice. <laughs> but if you go before,
before they say that, the, oh, where did he go? That takes it to leave like that. So, Mahavishnu was probably, probably said like that. He left his home. He left his family. Anyway, the point is, detachment has to come. It is part of the Vedic culture to cultivate this vairagya, detachment, knowledge and detachment. Where there is genuine devotion, then there will be those two things, knowledge and detachment from the world. So we want to cultivate them. The, the more we have devotion, naturally these things manifest in us. The example is given just like when you eat. In the beginning, maybe before you eat, you're hungry. And then you begin to eat. And as you're eating, you go on and you feel some satisfaction and relief from hunger. And then you feel nourishment. And then, okay, and, and I'm satisfied now. Can't eat any more. You know, you, you're full, right? That, that, that comes about just as you go on eating. So in a similar manner, when we do devotional service for Krishna, then we automatically cultivate these two things, knowledge and detachment from the world. It has to come about just naturally, just by serving Krishna. We don't have to try to give things up. It just naturally comes about by hearing and chanting and engaging in Krishna's service. So we actually see when we come to Krishna consciousness that we actually become free of all anxiety. It is the nature of devotional service that it brings immediate relief from all kinds of distress. The distress is there in the material world. The body, miseries of the body, so many. Miseries from other living entities, nasty neighbors, nasty bosses, employers, so many different living entities can give us dogs, you know. You walk about here in Thailand in the night, you'll get the problem with the dogs. You know, they're not like Indian dogs, you know. The Indian dogs are a bit more, they run away, but these dogs, they will just come and bite you, you know. Nasty. So living entities give us a lot of trouble. And then miseries of the material nature. Sometimes it's so hot. Other times it's so so cold. Sometimes like here, it rains so much. We're coming up this time so cramped. Traditionally, this is the time when the rain comes. It becomes very, very hot. Just like in India, the summer comes and then it's hot and hotter and hotter and then finally the clouds come and thunderstorms and heavy rain. So similarly also here in Thailand also we get coming soon is the, the rainy season. Any time it can rain now. So this is the misery of the material elements. Sometimes it's tsunami. Thailand had the big tsunami 20 years ago. Very, very, very big influence. Not only Thailand, Malaysia also. Many people. You, you, you came that time. You came to Phuket. Prabhu came to Phuket 20 years ago. We were distributed. We came. There was a tsunami. And Goku Prabhu came with other devotees from Malaysia 
and I was here and we, we were distributing prasadam and chanting Hare Krishna. We did Sankirtan on the beach because many people died. You know, the, the tsunami was just so powerful. And so there were many spirits, there were many ghosts and things around. So we were chanting Hare Krishna to liberate everybody. So anyway, mysteries of the material nature, sometimes it's earthquakes, and forest fires, and so many problems, so much suffering in the material world. We, we are looking for happiness, but this is not the real place to find happiness. We can make some temporary solution to the problem. But the real plot problem is we're here in the material world and we have to get out from this material existence and go back to be with Krishna. So this is Krishna consciousness to bring us out of this ignorance, to bring us to the spiritual platform. All right, are there any questions or comments? Yes, Manaji? Yaja? Yeah? Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Sorry. Um, so, sometimes I think is Krishna not very demanding because he has everything and he can actually everybody love him but he's not doing that instead he gives us choice but because we have a free choice we suffer so much so sometimes i think like does krishna care about our happiness or he cares more about his own happiness uh, i'm just thinking like very materialistically well remember i spoke about that the other night that real love is not forced. You are, you are saying, you know, Krishna can make us love him. But that's not pure love. He wants us to love him naturally. He doesn't want that he has to force us to love him. We come here on our own choice. We have come here to be independent of Krishna. We turn away from him. We want to forget Krishna. And so Krishna, oh, what can they do? They don't want to remember. The, the vast majority of living entities are there with Krishna in the spiritual kingdom. We are in the minority here in the material world. There's, you know, only a small portion of living entities here in this world. There's many, many more living entities in the spiritual world with Krishna. And they all love Krishna. But they love Krishna naturally by their own choice, their own doing. Krishna didn't force them. They themselves chose to love Krishna. And Krishna facilitated, he helped them to come to him. But we bring the sufferings on ourselves, just like the persons in the prison. They say, oh, the government, they're not doing anything to help me. Uh, but, I mean, you, you go against the laws of the government, what can they do? They have, to, they have to protect the citizens, they have to protect the public. So they arrest the criminals and put them in jail. But you can't blame the government for doing anything wrong. So similarly, we're here in the prison house, the material world. We're also like prisoners. Our material body is like the prison dress. And the, 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 we're in shackles. We're chained. The chains are the three modes of nature. Goodness, passion, and ignorance. They're like what's keeping us prisoners in this world. So we've put ourselves into this condition. 
it's not Krishna being, it's not that Krishna doesn't care about us, he does care about us. And that's why he comes in so many different incarnations, he comes and he performs different pastimes. And 5,000 years ago he came and spoke Bhagavad Gita for the benefit of everyone, to enlighten all of us. And he sent his pure devotees, pure devotees like Srila Prabhupada and other great acharyas. He will send them from the spiritual world. So he does care about it. Does, this is how he's caring. He sends all of these great souls and he comes himself and he speaks of Bhagavad Gita and performs all these pastimes just to attract us to try to bring us out of our ignorant condition and to convince us that there's really nothing here in this world to keep us here. That why are we so attached to being here in this place? There's really nothing to, that we can really hold on to, to enjoy for any length of time. So perhaps the thing is to just let go and hold on to Krishna. Give up the... the, the the hold over the material nature and take shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Sri Krishna. And that will deliver us from all the miseries. So this is the compassion of Krishna that he's, he's trying himself in so many ways to attract us and to bring us out of this world and to save us from the, the misery. But we're thinking, oh, nobody's helping me. No, you're, you're not caring about me. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's like maybe your parents, you know, maybe the parents are wealthy, and the parents are saying, you know, come home, we'll take care of you, you know, we'll, we'll do, pay for everything. For you. <laughs> no, no, I don't want to come. Just give me the money. You tell them, you tell them. I'm not going to come home. I don't want to be with you. Just give me the money. I will do it. I will enjoy it myself. So, you know, parents, they go, well, we gave you money before. You blew it. You spent it all. You wasted it all. You know, you got cheeky. And you, you, you lost all your money. Why we should give you any more money? You want to protect you. No, no, I just give me the money. <laughs> the, the parents, I think. Why, she, why we will give her any more money? We already gave her money. She lost it all, wasted it all. We're not going to give her any more. But if she comes home, we'll take care of her. Look. Like that. So Krishna's like that. He's the father. And he's inviting all of us to go back home to be with him. And he will take care of everything. There's no scarcity. And there's no question of overpopulation. There's no question of unemployment. There's no question of any anxiety or wars or anything. It, it, everyone lives in harmony in the spiritual kingdom. And but we're living in anxiety in this place. That's my response to your question. Thank, Thank you. you Any other question? Maharaj, yes. question about Maharaj. Tell that when you are in personal service, the knowledge can be that automatically becomes there. But mostly we saw that we are in devotional service, still we are attached and fools, so what we understand. We think we're in devotional service, yes. but we're still attached. Yes. Well, we have to be uh, attentive and, you know, we have to be uh, careful. Just like we talk about the anarthas, the dirty things in the heart. So it's not just only doing devotional service. But there's a certain quality also in devotional service that we have to endeavor for that better quality in our devotional service.
we have to be constantly checking ourselves to see how much are we actually progressing, how much are we giving up our attraction to the material world. Are we still drawn to watch the Bollywood movies every night? You know, some people, oh, there's a new Bollywood movie out, we have to watch it. People will sit up for hours to watch movies. He asked them, come from Mongol Arti. Oh, so early. I can come that time. You know, they don't want to make that sacrifice. So, similarly, people get money and they will spend a lot of money to buy clothes, jewelry, and the latest products, the things that, and you ask them, can you, can you give a donation for the temple? Oh no, I have no money. <laughs> you ask them, can you buy a book? Oh no, 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 no. So many other things I want to buy. <laughs> Like that, we have so many material attachments, you know. So we have to recognize our taste. How much are we developing the taste for Krishna to chant and to be with the devotees? Just like you come here to be with the devotees, that means you have a taste. You have some taste. You come here to be to spend the time with the devotees in concentrating devotional service. So it's very good. You have to go on from there, you know, you have to be careful. You, you, of course, you, at the same time, you have to go back to the material life, you have a job, you have to maintain different commitments and family responsibilities. They cannot be neglected. But at the same time, we should always think in our heart that I want to be more with Krishna. That when Krishna gives me the opportunity, then certainly I will make more effort to be with devotees and to chant Hare Krishna and to do devotional service. All of these other things are just temporary, just for some time that I'm going to give them up. As soon as, as, soon as Krishna can show me the way out to get free from all of these things. You see, the one, the one man was asking his guru, he said, Guruji, how can I get free from my material attachments? So the guru said to him, he said, just wait, in a little while I will tell you. So then later that afternoon, the, the disciple heard his guru calling out, help! Save me! Let me go! Let me go! And so the disciple came running, and he, and he came running, and he saw his guru was holding a tree. And the disciple looked at his guru, a guru shouting, Help! Let me go! And the disciple looked at his guru and said, Guruji, what's wrong? He said, I want to get free, I want to get free from this tree. And the disciple said, but Guruji, you're holding on to the tree. So then the Guru turned and looked at the disciple and said, yes. He said, the same way you're holding on to all these material things. You're saying how to get free. You're the one holding on. You just have to let go and you can be free. If we want to be free, we can be free. It's our choice. Do we take shelter of Krishna or Maya? Do we embrace Maya? You want to hold on to Krishna, you have to let go of Maya. If you have one foot in one boat, one foot in another boat, it would be very difficult. Two boats are going to come apart. So you have to be very careful. We want, if we want Krishna consciousness, we have to be willing to give up the attachment.
attachment to the maya, to the illusion. And it comes naturally without any effort, without even thinking about it, if you just stay in the association of devotees, chanting, and dancing, taking prasadam, and hearing about Krishna, and talking to people about Krishna, naturally you'll become Krishna conscious. Just like the mango. You get the green mango and you get the red mango. It just takes some time. Leave the mango on the tree and it will become red. So, devotees are like that. In the beginning we are like the green mango. We have the attachments. Of, but we just stay with, in the association, keep regularly chanting and hearing. Gradually we get free from all of this can experience the real life. Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna, Shri Prabhupada, Jai.